for those of you who don't know me, my name is John Brandon. I'm Senior Director of International Relations Programs for the Asia Foundation in Washington, D.C. I'm very pleased to welcome you this morning to our webinar that is featuring a new book by Ambassador Ted uh, Osius titled, Nothing is Impossible, America's Reconciliation with Vietnam. Um, for the past 30 years, even before normalization between the U.S. and Vietnam, Ambassador Osius had been uh, intimately involved in the, um, the renormalization of the relationship as, as well as the development of it over the last uh, quarter century. Um, he has, uh, when I first joined the Asia Foundation, uh, there was no diplomatic relations with Vietnam and to be able to see it today with a uh, robust uh, trade relations, strong people to people ties, and as well as I don't think anyone would have envisaged 25 years ago, um, an increasingly important um, security uh, relationship. And that Vietnam is also a leading uh, member of uh, the Association of Southeast Asian uh, Nations and, and plays an important role in that organization. Um, joining uh, Ambassador Osius uh, was ambassador to Vietnam from 2014 to 2017. Um, his first time there was when he uh, helped open the uh, U.S. consulate in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, and uh, during that time, uh, over, over the years, he's devised and implemented strategies to deepen security ties, signed tens of billions of dollars in commercial deals, expanded educational exchanges, concluded agreements on trade, law, and environmental protection, and addressed, honestly, the U.S. and Vietnam's difficult past. Um, He's helped create a, um, to bring about a positive transformation of U.S.-Vietnam uh, relations. Joining uh, Ambassador Osius is Di Dr. Michael D. Gregorio. He is the country representative uh, in Hanoi for the, uh, for the Asia Foundation. He has lived there for the past three decades, just around the time that Ambassador Osius began his work with uh, Vietnam. He's been our country representative since 2014. Uh, he leads projects and programs that address business-related disaster risk, city-level climate resilience, green finance, blockchain traceability for export agriculture, digital applications for the gig economy, trade facilitation, energy planning, and digital finance for rural and remote farmers and small enterprise owners. Uh, for many years prior to joining the foundation, uh, Dr. Di Gregorio worked for many years uh, at, for the Ford Foundation in, uh, in Hanoi. Um, Ambassador Osius is going to speak uh, about his uh, about his book, where he sees the the relate where the relationship, uh, how it's developed, where it might be going, and then um, Dr. Uh, Mike Di Gregorio is one of the few people that have um, have seen the book already and uh, has commented, and uh, he will um, um, serve as a discussant uh, and uh, perhaps pose some questions to Ambassador Osius. And then we'll open it up for questions and comments. Uh, I ask that any questions and um, uh, that you pose, that you um, that you put them in the uh, chat box. Uh, we are recording this session. I ask that when you do pose your question in the Q and A box, uh, that you um, that you identify yourself, your name, and your institutional affiliation. So uh, with that, uh, Ambassador Osius, the, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for, for doing this. Thank you so much, John. And thank you, Mike, for also, also for joining. Uh, it's different hours for people who are on this call. I know that uh, David Arnold got up early and is, sing and is participating in this call at 6 a.m. Folks in Asia, for folks in Asia, it's late at night. But thanks to all of you for joining. And I would note that on this call, are uh, many people who contributed a great deal to the normalization of relations between the United States and Vietnam, uh, who, who devoted uh, chunks of their lives uh, to bringing the two countries together. So I'm honored that you would join this call uh, and extremely happy to be able to talk with you uh, about Nothing is Impossible, about my book. The book is a, a set of stories it's stories about the people, including people on this call, about the people who contributed to the normalization of relations, who contributed to reconciliation uh, between our two countries, a process that is not finished. 
Um, but I, I really want to make clear, it is not, it's not a policy wonk book. It is a book of stories about people because I think what really reveals the most about what works when you're bringing people together is to talk about people and, and about relationships. So what I thought I would do is tell you two uh, brief stories about people uh, that, that kind of open the book, one from chapter one and one from chapter three, and then go wherever the discussion uh, carries us. But I wanted to begin with a couple of stories uh, so you get the sense of uh, what I'm trying to do with this book. Uh, tell the story of reconciliation through the stories of people. And I'm going to tell uh, some stories about Americans, but I can tell you there are also many stories in the book uh, about uh, Vietnamese who contributed uh, to this important process. So I'm going to start where the book starts in chapter one in uh, February 1991 on a, a Boeing airplane headed for Kuwait. It was a congressional delegation that was uh, looked, surveying the results of Operation Desert Storm. And on the plane, sitting across from each other, and this turns out to be very important, were uh, one Democrat and one Republican, uh, Senator John Kerry and Senator John McCain. And they were not friends uh, at that time. They, they just happened to have been seated across from one another and they started to talk and they talked all night. And they talked about the uh, very different experiences that they had in Vietnam, but experiences that led them both in the same direction. It was time to reconcile. Uh, between the, the United States and Vietnam. Senator McCain, whom I got to know over the last uh, quarter century of reconciliation, uh, was of course a, a Republican, uh, the son and grandson of admirals. He had graduated from the Naval Academy and he was shot down over Chukbak Lake in Hanoi uh, when he was carrying out one of his sorties against, against Vietnam. And because he was in, ejected from the plane with great force and hit the water with great force, uh, he was in bad shape by the time he landed. He had uh, two broken arms and a broken leg. And by the time people dragged him ashore, one uh, bone was, stick, was protruding through the skin. Uh, one leg was bent at a 90 degree angle. Uh, he, was, he was in a lot of pain. And the people who dragged him to shore uh, were not very sympathetic. They had, they, they had been suffering because of the, the bombing of their homes and their city. And um, uh, the, someone stuck a bayonet in his groin. And then he was dragged off to, to Hualo Prison, which the, was called the fiery furnace uh, when the French used it. Uh, we later referred to it as the Hanoi Hilton. And he spent six and a half years in that prison but after he was first dragged there, uh, he spent weeks without any medical care and only the support of his fellow prisoners really kept him alive. And at one point he was dragged before the warden and he trunked down to about hundred pounds. And he was, they had figured out that his father was Admiral McCain, who was in, in charge of the whole Pacific fleet. And they said, uh, McCain, you can go free. And he said, he, he thought about it and he uh, consulted with uh, other POWs who were staying with him about the military code of conduct. That code of conduct says, prisoners shall be released in the order in which they go into prison. And he went back to the warden and said, nope, I will go uh, when it's my turn. And the warden said, it's gonna be really bad for you, McCain. And it was. Uh, the next five, he spent a huge amount of time in solitary. Uh, he endured uh, terrible, ter terrible torture and deprivation. Uh, it was really bad for him for having uh, turned down that offer. But I, I think that was a very, very important moment in John McCain's life. And I think also an important moment in the story of reconciliation. Because even though he had suffered so much at the hands of the Vietnamese, when he sat on that plane across from John Kerry, he came up with, he, they, they together came up 
with how are we going to bring these two countries together? What are we going to do that will allow us to reconcile? And they decided to create the Senate Select Committee on POW MIA affairs. And they formed a very an improbable friendship that night that lasted for decades. Uh, so first they worked together on the, the Select Committee, uh, which was very, very important for the, the initial stages of bringing the two, the two countries together. And McCain and Kerry both were criticized uh, a great deal, especially by their fellow veterans. Uh, uh, McCain was called a Manchurian candidate. They, they were criticized a lot for the fact that they wanted to reconcile with Vietnam, but they persisted. They knew it was the right thing. Uh, I came to know them uh, both well, and I will tell, uh, you'll see in the book, the, the later stories, but I wanted you to understand that opening story and what, what the relationships, the relationships between two men uh, and the willingness to look beyond the past meant uh, for the re relationship between two countries. Uh, Secretary Kerry wrote the foreword to my book. It's a very kind and generous foreword. He was, he, he is throughout the book, uh, a wonderful friend and mentor and someone who uh, devoted a good chunk of his life to reconciling our two countries. Now I'll tell you one more story, uh, also about a, a veteran, and this is from chapter three. And this story begins in, for me at least, it begins in May 1997. Pete Peterson had, had been in Wallow Prison, the fiery furnace, along with John McCain. He also spent about six and a half years as a POW and uh, also endured uh, great hardship. And he was named by President Bill Clinton to be the first ambassador to a unified Vietnam. And in May, 1997, he arrived in Noi Airport and he was the first US ambassador since Graham Martin had left from the roof of the Saigon embassy 22 years earlier. And I was on, on the tarmac. I was a, a young political officer, eager to meet this historic figure, this new ambassador who had just arrived. And he sort of burst out of the plane and st strode down the, the steps. And he made a speech about the, the importance of bringing our two countries together. Uh, and he made clear to everybody that whatever animus he had felt, he had left it behind. He said, I left my hate at the gate when I left the, the, the prison. Um, he, he was welcomed, one of the people who welcomed him uh, was a person who had pulled John McCain from Triplock Lake. Um, and, and Pete spoke about the importance of normalizing relations between the two countries. Uh, and he spoke about the importance of fullest possible accounting for those who were still missing from the war, the work, the work that uh, John Kerry and John McCain had uh, pursued so relentlessly. He also said, we're gonna pursue a bilateral trade agreement during my time as ambassador, and then he did. Um, he, he took, he, he met with his new staff. I was one of the members of his new staff uh, later that day around a black, oblong table in the ambassador's office, which later became my office. Um, and he, he said, I'm gonna tell you something that my commanding officer uh, told me when I was in the Air Force. He said, you will get it right 98% of the time. The other 2%, I'll eat it. In other words, he would have our backs. He wanted us to go out and take risks for peace. And I, I was so uh, affected by this that these were the words that I said to my staff when I uh, had the great privilege to, to follow Pete uh, many years later as the sixth US ambassador to Vietnam. He, he wanted us to know that we were gonna get it right most of the time. Uh, and he, would, he, would, he wanted us to, to get out there and do what we could to build friendships, to build relationships, and if we were criticized, he would cover for us, and he did. He was a man of his word in, in, in every way. He, wanted, he, 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 he knew how important it was to bring the two countries together, 
And he didn't want us to behave like bureaucrats, but rather like people who were deeply committed to this process. And we were. Uh, he was called very quickly called to the presidential palace to present his credentials to uh, Lei Juk An, who was president at the time. And he was piled into a white limousine with four motorcycles that were white, flying white flags. And they drove him to the, the presidential palace and he walked up the sweeping steps uh, covered with a red carpet, president presented his credentials. Then he came back to the embassy and he's, I had a chance to talk with him afterwards. He said, Ted, that was a really strange experience. And he was referring to the, the limousine and all of the, the uh, trappings of the ceremony. He said, the last time I was in a Vietnamese vehicle, I was shackled to the floor. Uh, I remember that when I presented uh, my credentials 17 years later, uh, the, the, what he had gone through to get to that point and to make it possible for all of his successors to build on uh, what he had done uh, to bring two countries close together. To me, very, very powerful. Uh, we were all committed to his mission uh, of bringing the two countries together and uh, my friendship with him uh, remained very, very strong. Uh, he was the, the person who called John McCain before my confirmation hearings and said, uh, John, this guy's okay. And uh, that was all McCain needed to know. And then he, he was the first official guest that we had in the residence when I became ambassador. He and his wife, uh, V. Peterson, and, uh, who, was, who was born in Vietnam. And at a, a, a ceremony, uh, a conference marking the 20th anniversary of normalization of diplomatic relations, Pete said, you all should know in US-Vietnam relations, nothing is impossible. And that became, of course, it's the title of the book, but it also became for me the leitmotif of my ambassadorship to decide that nothing was impossible in US-Vietnam relations and to proceed accordingly. So I'm, uh, again, I'm very grateful to all of you for, for uh, joining this discussion. We're gonna go to Q and A, but I just wanted to mention um, a, a couple of things. If you uh, decide that you are interested in reading the book and you uh, and decide to, to pre-order it, uh, I will donate all of the proceeds that, that I receive, all the royalties to the Asia Foundation. Uh, I care a lot about the work of the Asia Foundation. Mike de, de Gregorio is a phenomenal leader in Vietnam. And all of the, uh, the royalties will go to the Vietnam program uh, at the Asia Foundation. And the other thing uh, I want you to be aware of is you can get it 30% off if you pre-order. So Shirley's gonna send around a flyer after this uh, to everybody, free shipping for those in the United States. And uh, there's a little code, RFLR19, that if you put in the, in the Rutgers, um, the, the, if you order on, from, from Rutgers, you get 30% off. I'll also send to anybody who wants them, um, because I can't do signings in the middle of the pandemic, uh, I will sign book plates that I'll mail to you, and you can slap them in, in the front, front of, the, of the book if you're at all interested in that. Um, and the, the book plates will have the, uh, the cover of the book on them. But uh, so happy that all of you could, could join this morning or this evening, depending on what time it is for you. And uh, very happy to answer, I think, first Mike's questions and then anybody else's questions. Thank yeah. you. Well, thank you, Ted. I just wanted to mention we do appreciate your support to the Asia Foundation. And I was remiss in my introduction not to mention that you are uh, a member of our, our board of trustees and that you're interested uh, not only just in Vietnam, but in, in the foundation's programming so throughout the Asia Pacific. So again, thank you for that. Uh, Mike, the screen is yours. I'm not sure if, I, if everybody can hear me. Uh, we can. Okay, great. Um, first off, I wanna thank Ted for his generosity. I got to, I got to meet Ted when uh, he was ambassador in Vietnam and uh, remained close to him since then. Um, 
I think he's a great guy and was a great ambassador to this country. Moved a lot of things forward uh, in the business community and in the diplomatic community, and especially among a lot of the NGOs. Um, Ted's, Ted's book is, uh, really focuses on individuals who made a, an extreme effort. I, when I was reviewing the book, I, I told Ted it reminded me of Profiles in Courage because it's a, a lot of personal stories of individuals who step outside of their prescribed roles or their expectations to do more than they had to to better U.S.-Vietnam relations. Uh, 20 something years ago, my friend and former boss, Charles Bailey, who may be on the call, I don't know. Uh, Charles told me that the goal of the Ford Foundation's international relations program in Vietnam was to build networks of friendship and trust among diplomats. Um, Charles argued that every country that is considered a rogue nation trains all of their diplomats in country. Uh, and he said that mixing students of dis diplomacy or international relations or international affairs or political science, people who tend to have a political career in a few well-known schools allows them to mix together and to build lasting friendships and relationships. And also to ensure that in a crisis, there are personal channels that can be used to resolve them. So here's my question uh, to Ted is, uh, from your experience, was Charles right? And if so, what are the limits to these personal relations? Thanks, thanks Mike, very much. And let me first uh, confess my bias. Uh, Charles is one of my heroes. He, uh, and I, I write a lot about Charles in the book because he took enormous risks to make sure that the United States took responsible action with regard to cleaning up Agent Orange. Uh, that, he, that became his mission and he's, he's written a book about it. He spent at least 30 years, I think, uh, devoted to that effort. And he worked with multiple ambassadors, including me, uh, on that long-term and I think critically important project. And he took a lot of risks in order to do that. So uh, Charles is a, is a hero to me and, and uh, he's one of those profiles in courage I, I tried to uh, present in the book. Um, I think he's right. I think that, and I've argued this in the book, I believe that successful diplomacy involves building trust. It's, it's, it's all about relationships. You build trust between people. And uh, there, there was, uh, it was Ross Perot and he ran for president years and years ago. He said, well, just replace all those diplomats with fax machines. We just need yeah. communication between leaders and capitals. He did not understand that it is all about relationships. Diplomacy is all about building trust. And as a result of trust, building partnership between nations. Now, I think the way that you build trust best is by showing respect and then by doing things together, you know, coming up with what I, I like to call joint endeavors, joint projects that get two countries working together on something that matters to both of their people. And then sometimes in the case of Vietnam, you can take that even further and do things together, not just for the two countries, but for the world as a whole. So now you have a situation where uh, Vietnam is involved in peacekeeping. And, uh, and Vietnam and the United States are working together on environmental challenges and on public health, including pandemics, of course. Uh, that to me is the result of careful tending of relationships, carefully building trust and uh, showing respect. Now there are recent leaders who think that uh, international relations are all about power and money and Power matters, money matters, national interests matter, but it's not, that's not the end of it. Uh, relationships also really matter. And I think we're seeing now with the strengthening of our alliances or re rejuvenation of our alliances and strengthening of our partnerships that uh, we, can, we can 
get to a place where we are showing respect and building trust and building partnerships uh, once again. I, I think it's relationships are absolutely at the center and, and Charles is 100% right. The limits come when national interests do not coincide. That fortunately is not the case in Vietnam. We have a lot of overlapping interests. Our interests are not identical, but in many areas, uh, our interests overlap and that's, that is long, uh, along with building trust and strong relationships is the foundation for a really strong partnership. I, I'm thinking now of Sergei Lavrov and John Kerry. Uh, yes. There was a time when they were quite good friends. Yes. Yes. Um, okay, Ted, I'll go on to my second question. And after this question, we'll open it up to the participants. And um, the question is, you know, ever, ever since the U.S. military began searching for MIAs in Vietnam, the defense relationship between Vietnam and the U.S., has been expanding. Where do you see this headed? Uh, what could accelerate and what could limit this relationship? It did start with fullest possible, account, uh, full, fullest possible accounting. I tried to describe that a little bit in my stories and the, the devotion of, of John McCain, John Kerry, and Pete Peterson to that mission. But then it started to move beyond. And I was the first political military officer starting in, in uh, 1996. And we, working with the first defense attache, Colonel Ed O'Dowd, uh, we were building step by step, uh, slowly, the elements of a relationship. Because you can't just race ahead and two enemies can suddenly become friends and, and military partners. It has to be a step-by-step -step process that builds trust. One of the first visitors was uh, Kirk Campbell, who at th that time was Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. And he talked about the importance of an exchange of visitors and a step-by-step -step process uh, of building trust and getting to know one another. Vietnam's military had not been working with other militaries and there needed to be a process so that we could understand each other. And, and a second really key element that I think underlies a, a, at least a fair amount of success is showing respect for your partner, finding ways to show respect for your partner. I had the good fortune uh, late in my tenure to host uh, Admiral Scott Swift. And uh, he was, he was uh, commander of the Pacific Fleet at that time. And he, uh, he and I followed the advice of a much later defense attache, Colonel uh, Tuan Tung, uh, T3 we call him. Uh, he advised us to go to the Bok Dan River uh, near Haiphong. Now, why would you go, why would you take the admiral, the commander of the Pacific Fleet to the Bok Dan River? Well, the idea was to show respect. There are, there's a statue, there are three statues on the edge of the Bakhtan River. Ngo Quyen, Le Dai Han, and Tran Hung Dao. And they were th three great generals who later became emperors or kings. And they, each one of them had, uh, had fought invaders from the north. And at the, where we went at the Bakhtan River, there were stakes in the river to represent the stakes that each of those three generals had stuck into the mud to defeat the Chinese fleet or the Mongolian fleet in, in, in the case of uh, uh, Chen Uh Why am I talking about this history? Well, that we were respecting Vietnam's military history. And I, I took the opportunity to, to read a poem uh, an 11th century poem uh, called Nam Phuc Son Ha. And in essence, that poem is Vietnam's first declaration of independence. It's, it, it goes, um, and I, I uh, don't have this memorized, but Song Nui Nuk Nam, Hu Nam E Zang Zang, Din Phan E Sat Choi, Ke Sao Lu Zak Sang Sang Phum, Chung Bai Se Bidang 
tell you why. Your pronunciation is better than mine, and I apologize if I made any mistakes, but the, the idea of the poem is the emperor of the South reigns over the mountains and rivers of the South. As it stands written forever in the book of heaven, how is it then that you strangers dare to invade our land? Your army shall be shamed and beaten. And this, this poem, uh, according to mythology, was read by God's envoys in support of Vietnamese troops who fought against invaders from the north. Now, why would an 11th century poem be relevant to today? Well, I thought it was relevant because it showed American respect for what the Vietnamese have dealt with uh, throughout their history. And it, I don't think it's a coincidence that I've been pushing the idea of uh, an aircraft carrier visit to Vietnam. And I brought it up with President Tran Dac Quang uh, many months earlier and he'd listened patiently. And then uh, President Trump raised it with Nguyen Xuan Phuc uh, when they met at the White House in uh, May of uh, 2017. Uh, but it was a month after uh, Admiral Swift and I went to Bakdan that the Vietnamese told the United States, we're ready for an aircraft carrier visit. And that aircraft carrier visit happened a year later. It was the Carl Vinson that went to Da Nang. It was the first US aircraft carrier to call in, into a Vietnamese port since the war. And then uh, two years later, the, I think it was the Theodore Roosevelt who uh, also called on, uh, pulled into to Da Nang. And each time an aircraft carrier comes ashore, it's 5,000 American sailors uh, who are coming aboard. That, that, in 2018, that was the largest number of uh, American service people to come ashore since the war. And I, I really do believe that showing respect is key if you want to move forward. Uh, the visit, those visits of uh, aircraft carriers uh, were more than symbolic. They were, they were uh, uh, a message to everybody that the United States and Vietnam had a new security relationship. Vietnam was doing more with the United States than with any other country. Not aimed at, that, at anybody else, but uh, in the interest, it's in the interest of both countries to collaborate. You asked about limits and I'll just briefly touch on that. Uh, one is that the Chinese will uh, urge the Vietnamese to slow down in the development of their security partnership with the United States. They have ways of putting curbs uh, on the process and of slowing the Vietnamese down. And then another problem is that uh, Vietnam for decades has relied on Russia uh, for its procurements, all of it, most 90% of its military uh, procurements. And the process of learning how the United States does procurement is complex. Uh, it takes, it takes a, a while to make a shift and to start diversifying sources of uh, military equipment. But I think that process has begun and um, that really in the end it will be, the only real limits will be those of, of political will. Uh, and I think that can be strengthened over time as long as you show respect and build trust and do things together. Thank you both. Uh, your comments uh, have uh, elicited a lot of questions. And so okay. why don't we go to the, uh, straight to the Q and A. Um, our first uh, question is from Richard Ha. Uh, he says, it seems like the reconciliation between the United States and Vietnam is an enormous success and a model for future diplomats to learn and apply in other places like North Korea, Iran, and Cuba. What would you tell the leaders of the above countries and American leaders to do or say that will initiate similar reconciliation processes? Will you, what would you also tell Vietnamese Americans to do to, to say and to replicate the same success because reconciliation is yet completed uh, between the Vietnamese uh, Americans themselves. In essence, what he's asking is what can uh, one draw from your book that will initiate other reconciliations among other people and other places around the world? Thank you. I uh, really appreciate that question. 
So the first part of it, I do believe there are lessons that can be drawn from our experience with Vietnam. We had a, a long and painful conflict and emerged from that conflict, people took risks and built a, a partnership and a friendship. I think you have to, it, it doesn't work, you can't uh, transfer the, the lessons uh, wholesale from one situation to another because every country has its own unique history, its own unique culture. One has to be absolutely respectful of different histories and different cultures and, and different challenges. But the importance of showing respect, of building trust, of doing things together is I think really critical. You, you don't build trust just by chatting at each other and, and getting together for drinks. I mean, you build trust by deciding we're gonna work together on critical issues. And for the United States that, and Vietnam that started with dealing with the legacies of the war. It started with fullest possible accounting, uh, cleaning up Agent Orange, uh, cleaning up unexploded ordnance, dealing with the, the critical legacies of the war. And that enabled us to work together on uh, science and technology collaboration. Eventually we were able to, uh, to uh, have a bilateral trade agreement and really deepen our commercial partnership. That's critical. Uh, and then we were able to move on, uh, as I mentioned earlier, even to multilateral collaboration, issues of importance to the world and not just to the two countries. I think those lessons modified for each situation uh, are quite relevant. And on the second question is about reconciliation between Americans of Vietnamese origin and Vietnamese in Vietnam. And that's a really tough one. Um, and I'll just tell a little story to, I think, to illustrate how tough it can be for some. I, I went, every, every U.S. ambassador goes to Orange County at some point uh, during the tenure. And I went early on, I went uh, a few times, but the very first visit, I was uh, in a big room flanked by Republicans and Democrats from the Congress. Um, at, at the time, Ed Royce was chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee and Dana Rohrabacher was there and uh, Alan Lowenthal and Zoe Lofgren, Republicans and Democrats. I, I spoke in Vietnamese for a bit, uh, made fun of my own Hanoi accent because a lot of the people in the room had a, a Southern accent and I had a Northern accent. Um, and that kind of gave them permission to ask questions in whatever language they wanted to ask questions. And I talked about my goals for for reconciliation, for bringing the two countries together, what I thought was possible. Um, and at the end of the conversation, uh, Ed Royce turned to me and back and said, Ambassador, you're doing great. This is, this is going well. At the end of the Q&A session, uh, a few people came up to, to talk with me. Uh, one person wanted to put the yellow flag around my shoulders and, uh, and take pictures. And I asked if she would not do that because that would make my job a lot harder in Hanoi and I wouldn't be able to, to advance the issues that were really important to her. And then another uh, person came up to me, an older gentleman, and he grabbed me by the lapels and he said, Ambassador, I spent 11 years in a reconciliation camp, a uh, uh, re-education re camp. And I said, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Is there, you know, is there anything I can uh, do to be helpful to you? And he said, Ambassador, I spent 11 years in a re-education camp. And I said, yeah, and I'm, I'm so sorry, you know, please tell me how I can be helpful. And he said a third time, Ambassador, I spent 11 years in a re-education camp. Reconciliation was not possible for him. He wanted those 11 years back. I couldn't do that. I couldn't give him that time back. So I, I am absolutely respectful of those for whom the, the pain is just too deep, too much, too much suffering occurred for there to be reconciliation. I get that. But I do think for the future, uh, it's, it's really important for Americans of Vietnamese origin to see 
what is possible in terms of reconciliation. More and more young Americans of Vietnamese origin have gone to, to Vietnam to seek opportunities there and to learn about the country from which their families fled. Uh, and they've, they're engaged in commerce and there are people working in NGOs and there are people uh, supporting the arts. And uh, it, it's, it's quite phenomenal to see that the strength of the ties between over 2 million Americans of Vietnamese origin and the, Ameri and the Vietnamese who, who live in Vietnam. But I get that it, reconciliation won't be possible for everyone. Uh, I just hope that it will be possible for the majority. And I think over time, it will become easier. And I think the Vietnamese in Vietnam want it to be easier, want that process to be easier for Americans of Vietnamese origin. And I think, um, I think there's concrete steps that can be taken on both sides, but actually particularly by Hanoi that would, uh, that would facilitate that process. Thank you, Ted. Uh, we have about 20 minutes left and we have 10 questions. So we're gonna have to uh, move as fast as we can, though I, I must tell the audience, we might not get to all of them. And if I have not, we have not answered yours. I and I'll, sort, I'll sort my answers, that will help. Okay. Um, our next question comes from Tamalia Alis Jabana. She's the cultural editor of the Independent Observer from Indonesia. Her question is of a different take. She says, you tell the story about the reconciliation of the US and Vietnam. What about the reconciliation needed within America itself, which has become so polarized that it threatens America's democracy? What do you as a seasoned diplomat advise for the reconciliation within your own country? Of course, I worry about that. Uh, I worry about what's happening in the United States. Um, I do believe that there are some lessons that may be relevant. I think the showing respect for those who may have different views is critical if the United States is to continue to have, to, to demonstrate e pluribus unum, the, to bring from all, and this is actually the same as Indonesia's, uh, there's a different uh, version of it, but the same idea is central for Indonesia, uh, from many one. In unity, there is strength. I believe that America's strength, and, and Indonesia's for that matter, uh, comes from its diversity. When you have a lot of different people who come to a challenge with different perspectives, you're much more likely to have good solutions. Innovation is born of the fact that people bring different ideas and different perspectives to the table. But it's really critical to do what we tried to do with Vietnam, and that is show respect, build trust, do things together. I think the lessons of diplomacy may be quite relevant for the United States as well. Uh, thanks for that. Our next question is from Frank Ohm. Uh, he says there are parallels between Vietnam and North Korea, their poor bilateral relations with the US communist country, US POWs, MIAs still in country. Are there any lessons, takeaways that can be used for US reconciliation with North Korea? There doesn't appear to be leaders like John McCain and John Kerry to drive any kind of reconciliation process between the two countries. So I, I've written in the book uh, about the challenges that we faced with North Korea while I was ambassador and then subsequently. It was to me fascinating that the Trump administration uh, and uh, Kim Jong-un chose to have their second summit in Hanoi. It was at the Metropole Hotel. Um, or at least some of the meetings I think occurred at the Metropole. At the Metropole. It was um, an indication that there were parallels in, in history. It's also a place that Kim Jong-un could travel to by train. He, liked, he likes to travel by train. You can get from Pyongyang to to Hanoi by tra train, it doesn't take too long. Um, but the, the message was, I thought the message that uh, Trump and Secretary Pompeo, Pompeo were trying to convey with that choice of venue was look what can happen if you reconcile with the United States. Instead of being isolated, you can become rich. And you know, Vietnam is rapidly developing in part, at least in a significant part, because uh, it 
developed, had this bilateral trade agreement with the United States, uh, opened its economy and uh, developed a good relationship that helped Vietnam enter the WTO, enter the, the mainstream of the global economy. Uh, the, a lot of the, the economic progress that we've seen in recent years it was certainly uh, born of the fact that the Vietnamese took very brave decisions uh, in the in the mid '80s, but then stuck with it, stuck with the idea of of international uh, comprehensive international integration, particularly in the economic realm. And I think that was also an indication to the North Koreans: you can do much better if you're part of the world and if you have a good relationship with the United States. So think about the advantages. It's always, it's always good in a negotiation to be able to have some, some carrots as well as sticks. And I think they were dangling some carrots in front of the North Koreans uh, with, that, with that choice of venue. Now the summit didn't go very well. Um, and uh, some of the people, unfortunately on the North Korean side who helped set it up, lost their lives. This is, this is how it works in North Korea. Um, and, and it didn't lead to a lasting peace, but I, don't, I think that's because the homework wasn't done. You only have a really successful meeting of the minds when you're willing to do the hard work of diplomacy, building up to a, a summit as the, the moment when agreements are, are completed. Uh, and that work is hard and it requires patience, persistence and trust. And that was not yet there. Our next question is from Murray Hebert, a senior uh, fellow uh, for the Southeast Asia program at CSIS. Um, his question is simply, are there things that you would hope to achieve as ambassador that you couldn't pull off in the end? That's a, thank you, Murray. Um, there were things that I couldn't pull off. I had a long list and I hadn't been able, I wasn't able to move the, us, us from the, terrible dilapidated old embassy that we were in to a new embassy during my time as ambassador. I did find a, a location to build a new embassy, uh, but I wasn't able to pull that off during my time and left that uh, to my successor. I also spent, I think, better at two and a half years uh, trying to get the funds to finish the job of cleaning up Agent Orange. Referred to that earlier when we were talking about Charles Bailey and his pioneering work. But we had cleaned up, we, uh, we had cleaned up dioxin, thanks to the work of my predecessors. We had cleaned up uh, uh, dioxin in Da Nang and we hadn't finished, we hadn't cleaned it up in Bien Hoa by the time I left. Now the good news is Stan Crittenbrink stayed on the case and Tim Reeser uh, stayed on the case. And they were eventually able to persuade the uh, Department of Defense that this was really critical. Dealing with these legacy, the, the legacies of the war was critical for a successful security relationship. And they were able to obtain the funds to do the cleanup in Bien Hoa uh, that, will, that will save a lot of lives. Uh, I was ashamed of how long it took us to get to that point, but I'm glad we were able uh, finally to get there. So that, that was an unfinished task, but I'm really glad. This is what happens. You, uh, each person is able to pass the baton on to another. And Dan Crittenbrink's going to pass the baton to Mark Knapper. And he will be able to, to finish some of the things that have been left uh, undone by his predecessors. And it's a, it's a pretty uh, wonderful tradition. Um, that's, that's one I would have liked to finish during my time. Um. Dinuk Kolumbaj um, asked the question, the U.S. retreated from Vietnam following what some would describe as a defeat. Similarly, America's withdrawal from Afghanistan is viewed in a similar vein. Do you consider it possible for America to establish similar relations with Afghanistan as they have with Vietnam? It's possible. Nothing is impossible. Uh, the, some of the factors aren't there that would build the kind of relationship that we have with Vietnam. I would cite, first of all, you know, the 2.1 million Americans of Vietnamese origin. They are, that's a critical constituency uh, for keeping members of Congress focused on Vietnam, 
keeping the administration focused on Vietnam. And we don't, there are not that many uh, Americans of Afghan origin in the United States. So I think the, the circumstances are not the same and I wouldn't expect precisely the same result, but you could, we could have a healthy relationship with Afghanistan years and years from now uh, if we at least if we at least follow a few key principles, uh, show respect, do things together, build trust, uh, work with that country going forward. Our next question comes from Nam Pham. Uh, he says one of the hopes of uh, renormalization of uh, or normalization of the relationship between Vietnam and the U.S. was that the Vietnamese government would be more democratic and more respectful of basic human rights for the Vietnamese people. Now that a quarter century has gone by, um, perhaps uh, the, the um, uh, Vietnamese government has fallen short uh, on, um, uh, on that count. Um, can you lend any insight to this, uh, Ted? I agree that the government has fallen short on when it comes to human rights and spend, I devote a whole chapter, or actually more than a chapter, but chapter 11 in the book uh, is all about human rights. And I was an outspoken, I was very outspoken when I was ambassador about uh, mistakes that I felt the government was making in terms of um, keeping people silent. Uh, there, especially the, the arrests of bloggers and uh, the, the, you know, constant, the kind of constant process of, of arresting people for speaking out. Uh, I, I was very frustrated by that, uh, spoke out about it again and again. And I, I went to, at one point, to uh, the, the training school for, for uh, comrades, the, the Ho Chi Minh uh, Institute, and said, look, you, you can be confident enough to know that Vietnam can continue to strengthen and grow even if people express themselves and have different views from, from those of the party. Uh, you're, 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 gonna, you're gonna have a better chance to succeed if you let those views be heard. Um, the, the one fact, because I've seen the relationship over 25 years, is there's a, a lot more space for expression now than there was 25 years ago. The trends are good. Uh, one factor is the internet. A lot of things are, are expressed on Facebook and on the internet that simply weren't possible when I first went to Vietnam. So the, the trends towards uh, greater self-expression among the Vietnamese people, uh, I think are, are positive. The, what I think gets in the way is Vietnam has such a long history of turmoil and conflict that a lot of leaders in the party are really afraid of any sign of dissent. And they get very, very nervous if there's their protests or if there are bloggers who are, are speaking out. Uh, and I think they should, they should understand that that is, uh, that is not threatening to the stability of the country. Uh, in fact, there needs to be space for, for expression. And in a one party system, that's a lot harder. Uh, if there were a free press, that would be a lot better. And I think Vietnam would succeed if there were a lot more space for, for free ex expression. It would continue to succeed. And I think it would succeed uh, better than if it is determined to clamp down on, on those voices. Now, the other piece of good news is that Vietnam is not following the model of China. There are some people who, who think, oh, well, there's you know, a lot of repression uh, in China. Um, there's a surveillance state. Uh, Xi Jinping is a, is a really heavy handed leader. Vietnam is not going the way of China, but I think Vietnamese leaders would do well to, to allow much greater room for expression than they do now. Our next question comes from Brantley Womack, uh, who's a professor emeritus at the University of Virginia who follows both China and Vietnam very closely. Um, 
He says, it's wonderful to hear a discussion of the importance of the United States-Vietnam relationship that does not derive its importance from our rivalry with China. To what extent does our tension with China help our relation with Vietnam? And to what extent does, extent does it distort our view of Vietnam? So in recent years, uh, China has engaged in a lot of bullying of its neighbors, especially in the South China Sea. And I don't think it's uh, a surprise to anybody that Vietnam, as a result of that bullying, has to seek partners elsewhere. So there is a fact, there, China does play a role in the relationship. I just, I do think that uh, people sometimes look at the relationship only through that prism. Yes, that is a strategic fact that the Chinese are aggressive in the South China Sea and Vietnamese uh, need to feel the need to respond to that aggressive posture and are seeking uh, friendships elsewhere so they have more options uh, for dealing with challenges from their northern neighbor. But Vietnamese leaders have been very good for a long time at uh, finding ways to balance relationships, making sure that they continue to have good relationships uh, with Beijing, as well as good relationships with Washington and with Brussels and uh, with ASEAN. Uh, the Vietnamese diplomats are very good at this. If you, if you look around the region, I can't think of any group of ASEAN diplomats that are more strategic in their thinking than Vietnamese diplomats. Uh, so it's one factor, but it is not the only factor. The, the, one of the things I really tried to explore in the book is how many facets there are to this relationship and how important it is intrinsically. It's important from a commercial standpoint. Uh, it, the, our partnership with, with Vietnam uh, opens up possibilities uh, for collaboration on the great challenges that the world now faces, whether it's climate change or pandemics or demographic changes, financial crises, the big challenges coming at us are dealt with much better in partnership with other countries than the United States trying to deal with them on their own. So we learn a lot from these partnerships. I had the privilege of, of working on a comprehensive partnership with India, comprehensive partnership with Indonesia, and a comprehensive partnership with Vietnam. In each of those partnerships, we are learning as much as we are sharing our knowledge. And I think that is the way of the future. I hope that we'll continue to, to build coalitions around key challenges with key partners such as Vietnam. We are about coming up to um, the bewitching hour. Um, we have um, just about another minute or two left. I'd like to go over a little bit, uh, if you're okay with that, Absolutely. Ted, Mike. Um, we have nine questions left, but we're, I'm gonna ask uh, two. And uh, one is from Mark Mannion of the Congressional Research Service, the other from Michael D. Gregorio. And then we'll ask you both to, to make some final comments and wrap up. And for all those uh, whose uh, questions I have been, uh, we have been unable to uh, address this morning, uh, my apologies. Um, Mark uh, basically asked the question of, what are the opportunities and limits for Congress to influence the course of a bilateral relationship like the US, uh, like US Vietnam relations? Thank you, Mark. Uh, the, there was no way we could have reconciled if there hadn't been congressional leadership. So I, I, just using, using Vietnam as an example, members of Congress reached across the aisle and decided it was in America's interest to heal the wounds left over from the war, but also to build a partnership with a, a, a country that's in a really important region uh, and could be a, an important strategic friend to the United States. Uh, at, at, in that region. And that was, in, it, there was no way that I think Bill Clinton could have taken the steps he took without bipartisan support for that effort. Uh, and then I would say there's continued in the, in the case of Vietnam, that bipartisan support for the relationship, for doing right with regard to the past, but also for seeing what opportunities there are for the future. That bar, bipartisan 
collaboration has continued. So you have, you have people like Dan Sullivan, uh, Senator Republican from Alaska. You have, of course, Senator Patrick Leahy, who's been a great hero of dealing with uh, past challenges. You have members of, of the, the Vietnam caucus in the House from both parties. And when, when Congress can be united on something, it's really, really powerful. And it uh, really helps advance, I think, uh, useful uh, policy objectives for the United States. And uh, I think Vietnam is one of the best examples of that. Um, the, the administration can only go so far on a policy initiative without the support of, of Congress and, and without, especially without uh, bipartisan support. So, so I think Vietnam is a great example of when it, when it works and how to make it work. The, the, original, the original team that brought the countries together, I call them the Gang of Five, um, was a bipartisan team. And uh, for more about that, please, please take a look at the book. Mike? Hi, Ted. Hi. Uh, you and I were both at the Daewoo Hotel, and I think it was the 10th anniversary of USAID, uh, whole operations in Vietnam, when then Secretary of State John Kerry gave a phenomenal speech that I, I was just aghast. Um, I'm sure you'll remember that speech in which he said, America's got its flaws, but we've got things that we hold sacred. And you do too. And we will respect your political system. We will respect the things that you hold valuable. And uh, you probably remember that speech in more detail than I do. I just remember being in awe that a diplomat was standing up in Vietnam talking like that instead of talking down, you know, saying there's a lot of things you people have to learn uh, and we're going to teach you. Um, my question to you is, I don't know what happened after that, but do you think that moment was significant in uh, U.S.-Vietnam relations? And, and why? I think it was very significant. Uh, that statement of respect for different political systems was first made by the President of the United States, Barack Obama, to uh, General Secretary Nguyen Phu Chong in the Oval Office. And that was a, it was a deliberative process that led to making that statement about respect for different political systems. The, what the president was saying, and later the Secretary of State said publicly, was we're not trying to overthrow your regime. We want to work with you. And we believe there's much more can be gained if we work together than if you're fearful that, that our ultimate goal is your overthrow. And it was very important for uh, General Secretary Nguyen Phu Chong to hear that from the President of the United States, especially in the Oval Office. And then I think it was very important for John Kerry to state that publicly at the Daewoo Hotel uh, when you and I were uh, in the audience listening. It was, and it also, you, you referred to what uh, Secretary Kerry did as not talking down. Secretary Kerry deployed respect. He always, always showed respect to those with whom he was, he was working. Uh, and he had a lot of respect for the Vietnamese and he showed that respect and they returned that respect. So he was a, a, absolutely trusted inter, interlocutor by the Vietnamese. He cared deeply about the relationship and they knew that. The Vietnamese leadership knew that and they knew that they could trust him. So it comes back to these fundamentals of, of respect and trust. He would also be very direct about things that we didn't agree on. He was very direct on human rights and so was the president. And uh, that was of course the hardest part of my job. Uh, but I, I, I tried to follow their example. I was very direct when it came to the issues that we don't 
who didn't agree about. But you don't have to do that in a way that is condescending or disrespectful. Uh, President Obama, talking about human rights, said, our record isn't perfect. He was dealing with Ferguson, Missouri at that time. He said, we know we've got a long way to go to, to perfect our union. And uh, Secretary Kerry, I think, also approached challenges with a little bit of humility. You know, we're not, we're not gonna tell you what to do. We're gonna work with you as partners and see if we can't find solutions together. And I do think that that element of, of res respect is what enables you to build trust and then accomplish things together. We have run out of time, but I'll each give you a minute um, to if there's anything else you'd like to say before I make some uh, closing remarks. Uh, Mike, would you, do you have anything you'd like to say? I uh, know I don't. I think uh, Ted just said it all just uh, a couple of minutes ago. Okay, Ted? I really wanna thank you, John, and you, Mike, and the Asia Foundation for, for hosting this event, for caring about the book, uh, for caring about U.S.-Vietnam relations. I, I think uh, the Asia Foundation has been there for a long time doing a lot of good in, in, the, in, in Vietnam. And I'm really proud to be able to partner with you. I, I, I go back to the, you know, the days of, of Charles Bailey and then forward to the days of uh, Mike de Gregorio and what the Asia Foundation has been able to accomplish. And I'm super happy that I'll be able to uh, donate money from the sale of the, the book to the Asia Foundation to keep that very important work going. It matters a lot to me. Uh, it matters a lot to me that the relationship continues to flourish. And I hope that the, the book provides some guidance or some, some, some hints, some ideas about how to keep it flourishing and how to, how to move it forward. Thanks very much. Well, well, thank you, Ted. Well, I was listening to the both of you talk over the past hour or so. Um, it reminded me of a dinner that I attended when uh, the U.S. and Vietnam had just normalized relations. Uh, the U.S. Vietnam Business Council and the U.S. ASEAN Business Council had hosted a dinner for the then new ambassador, Ambassador Le Bon. And he gave a speech that uh, just sort of captivated the audience of about 250 people. But the one sentence out of that, um, uh, out of that speech that I remember you know, a quarter century later, and I think many others who were there did, uh, would as well, is, is saying that uh, Vietnam is a country, not a war. And I think your comments, both of your comments over the past hour uh, have, um, have illustrated how, you know, yes, we do have uh, uh, a history. We did have a war in, in, in Vietnam. Uh, but at the same time, we now have a strong uh, bilateral relationship that uh, economically we're, we're trading with, you, with each other. It's growing. The people-to-people -people ties are growing. More and more Vietnamese students are, are, are studying in, in the United States. Americans are going to, uh, to, to Vietnam. And, you know, as you mentioned, our security relationship is, is, uh, is also uh, growing. Yes, there are, are irritants. But, uh, but nonetheless, uh, I think today we are looking at it as a country and more so, not so much as that that's a place where we once had a war. And so I think a great deal of credit goes to both of you and, to, and to, to other diplomats, business people, NGO leaders to have helped make that happen. Um, again, my apologies to the audience for uh, not being able to answer all of your questions. We, we probably should have... Uh, uh, blocked in maybe two hours instead of one. But uh, I wanted to thank you all for coming, for your thoughtful questions, and again, uh, Ted and Mike, for your, for your uh, thoughtful and insightful uh, comments. Uh, so with that, thank you all for coming, and we look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye. Thanks good for day. mentioning, John, thanks for mentioning Levan, who is okay. a great hero of reconciliation, uh, who I write about in the book, and thanks to all, everybody for participating in this discussion. That. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Good day, good night. Bye-bye.